Welcome to Adopt and Class. I have six good questions, very interesting pharmacological questions that will stimulate your mind. Um, we will talk about prioritization at the same time, embedded in SATA, but the hour of pharmacology. I think you should watch this. Stay around and just uh, let's see what we have. Uh, you will enjoy this. Um, once again, um, I would like to see you on Saturdays, every Saturdays, 3 to 5.30 uh, p.m. This is the passcode. It's a Zoom link. and We can talk about Anchor stuff, questions, review. So I would love to see you, okay? So this is the question we have. First, first one, as usual, this is a site to make you comfortable with SATA. So every question will be in a SATA form so that you can have multiple ideas of what is going on. And we already know how to do our setup. We go for our acts, our case, buzzwords, then we rewrite it. And then after we write it, we come with our content and then we use the content to answer the question. We identify each question and we don't compare. We start from the top, make a decision and keep on going down. And that's all we do. That's all we're going to do. So we, and it's better to read the question backward. It's always better to read it backward. So who need immediate modification of care plan? Um, select all that apply. So we have a separate question. And then our ask is somebody need immediate care, right? And our case is usually the rest of the question. And nurse is carrying up for five patients all due for 8 a.m. medication. So they need their 8 a.m. medication and then somebody need um, immediate intervention or modification of care. So our buzzwords means we have to intervene and then medication. So two words. You're taking some medication and you're due for it and we have to intervene if the medication should be given to you or not. So we start from number one, a client on lensinopril with potassium of what? 5.5. Potassium of 5.5 lensinopril. Then you have to bring your thinking cap down, your buzzwords from that, and your knowledge. You know lensinopril is what? They are all in potassium sparing medication. So lensinopril is going to increase your potassium. We don't need to go through angiotensin, um, running angiotensin system, but they spare your potassium. If they're sparing your potassium and the potassium is 5.5, we got to be sharp about it. So this is a priority action. We have to be sharp. And being sharp, one of the problems is electrolyte. The electrolyte, we talk about magnesium, potassium, sodium, and calcium. Whether they can be low, they can be high. Potassium of 5.5 and lensinopril, which is going to spare your potassium, will also let it go up. And therefore, this is a problem. And we have to be sharp and we have to see this patient. A client on spinolactone and a potassium of 5.5. Same thing. Spinolactone is a potassium sparing. It's going to increase your potassium. 5.5 will go up. Therefore, we got to see this patient. We are being sharp. A client on trimeterine and a potassium of 4.3. Trimeterine is also a potassium sparing. So I intentionally put it there because sometimes everybody knows spinolactone, but they don't know trimeterine. It's also a potassium sparing. So that increases the potassium, and the potassium of 4.3 I think it's okay. We don't need to see this patient. It will go up at 4.3 is still fine. So um, we don't have to intervene right now. A client on ferrosamide and a potassium of five. You know, ferrosamide, you usually waste your potassium. It's a potassium waste. So it's going to lower your potassium. So ferroximide is a potassium and waste. So like I could call it. So if potassium is five, your potassium is going to go down anyway. So 
we don't need to intervene with this patient. A client on Lorsartan and a potassium of what? 3.5. Lorsartan is an ARB. And ARB usually will also increase your potassium. And this is 3.5. We good. We don't need to intervene. So the only people we got to intervene is lensinopril with the potassium 5.5, spinolactone, and potassium 5.5. The rest is okay. This one is also potassium sparing, but 4.3 is fine. Um, your body will compensate. It has not get to a level that is too high. And this is, I intentionally said this question so that you can know some of the questions they like to ask about potassium. These are medications you have to know that they are one of, some of them are potassium sparing, some of them are potassium wasted. So they may ask you questions so that you have to think about your being sharp, priority action, laces, and that's furosemide, hydrochlorothiazide, waste potassium, and the rest um, usually will make you keep your potassium. So they're very, very important. Your board like potassium. So you have to know those medications. The next one, same thing. This is a different one. It's a priority, but you get to think. Which assessment, we always read from the back, which assessment finding need immediate intervention? So we got to intervene. That is our ask. Okay, a patient with a known history of what? Tonic, chronic seizure. Okay, that's the case. Has been on phenotype for what? Six months. Which assessment finding need immediate intervention? So the case is on some medication and then I need to do something to intervene. That means whenever you see intervene, that means they're looking for side effect. So the buzzword is what? Phenotype for six months and something is wrong. So when it actually to intervene, like I said, looking for side effect, but you have to be sharp, right? Sharp, which is being sharp, okay? You're looking for things in the B sharp and that you're going to use to answer the question, okay? It's a priority action. You're not going to pick an answer choice that is suspected of that medication. The worst side effect of that medication is what you're going to use. So you go back and you say, what is your content? And phenotype is anti-seizure medication, right? Um, and it's very common. It has multiple side effects. Um, and the worst side effect is Stephen Johnson syndrome. Or I would say a pregnant lady who is taking it. Because if you take it, the baby is going to have defective symptoms and then um, they have some neurotube defect issue. So those are the two things I'm looking for. If I don't see them, then I'll go to the next level. So those ones, um, Stephen Johnson syndrome and a, a pregnant lady who is taking it or somebody is taking it and not using barrier medication for to prevent them from getting pregnant. Horizontal nystagmus is common. That means your eyes is flipping back and forth. It's common with and phenotype. So this is not something I have to be sharp about. This is unexpected. This is where they can trick you. So that's not a problem. Gingiva hyperplasia is the common side effect and usually occur in young young patient taking over 500 milligram of a phenotype um, twice a day. So that is expected. They need a dental care. You have to educate them. You got to de decrease the dose. Don't get distracted by this. Everybody think about gingival hyperplasia, gingival hyperplasia. It's never always a priority. Um, I may keep it for now and see which one is over there. Okay, so it, because of the bleeding associated with that. So it's a question mark, but um, I'm going to check for one that is um, worse than this. A small purple rash on the chest. This is... What is the Stephen Johnson? They have like a small rash on the chest, then it spread throughout the body, and then they, the skin will peel, they become septic, they go into shock. So we have shock and sepsis on the B-sharp. And so this one is better than that. I take this off. On steady gait is also the same thing. It's related to the nystagmus. People who take phenotype may have on steady gait. They are all important because guess what? 
they are all important because they can um they can uh, lead to fall. Now, stagnants and unsteady gait, they can lead to fall if you don't take care of it. But in this situation, the one that will make the patient have a problem, morbidity and mortality is what you're looking for. You're number one. So this is okay, but it's not my priority right now. This one will, is more dangerous. So small purple rash on the chest is what it will be my uh, priority action. That is the clue for your test. You keep on staying focused. Stay focused. Don't let any answer distract you. Know what you're looking for and go fish it out. Okay. So number three, same thing. We're back to the satire. I'm trying to play a trick with your mind. We go satire, we go priority, satire priority. So we're doing some fun game here. Select, select all that apply. And what is being asked, who need immediate intervention? And this is caring for six patients. Six patients who need care. That need immediate intervention. Okay. You have number one, a client on Lensonopro, right? With a potassium of 5.5. Good. Receiving K isolate. So you have to bring your content as always. You know Lensonopro. And the patient potassium is 5.5. .5. The lensinopro is what is increasing the patient potassium 5.5. .5. And we want to drop it down. So the content here is when somebody is hyperkalemia, K okay, is high, there's treatment for that. You give them insulin. So insulin, is, you use insulin to drop the uh, potassium inside. You give them glucose. You give them abudro, okay? Abudro will also drive the potassium down and you give them k -acylate. k -acylate is taken orally and it is a resin that binds to potassium and pull the potassium out of the cell. Guess what? You got to think about it. So is there anything wrong with it? Somebody with lensinopro, I'm giving him k -acylate. No, the k -acylate will lower your potassium by what? getting rid of potassium and increasing your sodium. So it can give you fluid overload because it can retain your potassium. So you got to, but the, the, the teaching moment here is how to treat hyperkalemia. You see, I bring content at the same time in the SATA and pharmacology. This is how they are interconnected. How to treat hyperkalemia, give them uh, insulin, give them insulin first, followed by glucose, then, um, insulin glucose, then abudro, then k -acylate. And if it doesn't improve, they get dialysis. So this patient is okay. We don't need to do anything about it. We give, we're treating the patient really well. A client with no bowel movement for three days and a potassium 5.5 .5 receiving k -acylate. I wanted to add this idea because this is one of the side effects they may trick you with. K isolate, like I told you, you patient take it by mouth, and then we'll have to have bowel movement to poop the potassium out. If you have bowel obstruction or you have ileus or you, you, you constipated, these are all negative. No K isolate because they cannot poop. If you need a, you have to poop, you have to have a bowel movement to be able to get rid of the potassium. So if you can't have bar movement, then you have a problem. If you don't have bar movement and you constipated, the KS late will stimulate you and it will cause bowel perforation. This is where you have bowel perforation and that will become a really big, big sharp moment because it's a stimulant. It will stimulate you and if there's already constipation, the bowel will perforate. So this patient need intervention. A client with asthma prescribed spirivia, that means teotropium by mouth. Okay, content, content, content. Asthma patient, they need some medication. They need a, um, a, a better, a, a basically anticholinergic to help. So they need a better agonist to relieve the obstruction in addition to um, anticholinergic. 
you can see, you can recognize this medication. Look at the last name, tropium. When you see something tropium or something pium, it's always anticholinergic. So tropium, even if you don't remember, there's only a few medications that asthma people can take. So you expect the only two few medications. So asthma people need a beta agonist. They need an anticholinergic, and then they need some steroid, inhaled form of steroid. So if you don't remember at all, you can figure it out. Oh, this is not a beta blocker. It doesn't have the law at the hand. It doesn't look like steroid it based on how it usually what you see this steroid usually written. And tropium is always related to anticholinergic. That's the last name. So that's how you remember pharmacology, basically association. Then the key fact I want to emphasize is this medication is very tricky. It's Perivia, okay? It's an, it, it comes in the capsule. So that's the key. It's a capsule. So patient think they will look at it as a capsule. Oh, let me take it by mouth. No, he has to put in the inhaler um, and then inhale it. So even though it's a capsule, the capsule you put in the um, inhaler and the inhaler pierce the capsule and then you inhale the content. So crushing it or taking it by mouth is on us. It's not expected. Um, not expected. It's not acceptable. So patients should not do that. They should not chew it, crush it, or swallow uh, spirivia, protopium, because even though it's a capsule, um, because it's an inhaler and they have to, it has to be inhaled, so they have to put it in the in inhaler and uh, in the spacer, and then they will inhale it. Um, so that is the trick. So taking it by mouth is not correct. So we got to intervene. A client with a VRE infection prescribed penicillin. Remember, a VRE is a really, really bad uh, infection. And then it's a skin infection, is a multi-drug resistance. So VRE is, a, you treat them like MRSA, so they are almost the same. They are like multi-drug, resistant drug. So um, you have to give them the strong antibiotic. They are sensitive to penicillin, but not that great, okay? You have to give them a stronger form, something that can attack them. And what the medication for this is vancomycin. So vancomycin is used for VRE, and MRC, penicillin is not that strong, it's a baby. So this one, we get to intervene. A client with C. diff infection and sulfur allergy on metronidazole. You have to associate things when you see the question. C. diff, sulfur allergy, and what? Metronidazole. What is the relationship here at all? What is going on? Uh, what, is, what is going on here? C. diff infection, and allergy and the metronidazole. And you think about it. Metronidazole is a sulfur drug. Therefore, if you're allergic to sulfur, then we shouldn't give it to you. We're going to kill you. So this patient, we also have to intervene. So we intervene here, we intervene here, and we intervene here. So and a client on Manitol, for high ICP and a pink feudal sputum. This is a hard one, okay. When somebody ICP is very high, we give them manitol. And manitol is osmotic diuresis. It pull fluid from the brain, okay. There's two things you can use, 3% or three to 5% hypertonic saline for somebody with the ICP, or you can give them manitol. Manitol is a form of sugar. Yeah, it's a high concentrated level and it pull fluid out of the brain. And you bring all the blood, think about it. This is your blood, your blood vessel. Now you're pulling all blood and fluid into the vessel. What is going to happen? You get a fluid overloaded. So 
fluid overloaded. So the, the intravascular system becomes too much fluid because it's pulling fluid inside. But it's doing its job. You go to the kidney and the get, kidney get rid of all the fluid. You have to watch. Number one sign that you have to watch for uh, manitol because of the pathophysiology is pulling fluid into the intravascular system and you're becoming fluid overloaded. What is the number one complication of fluid overloaded? Pulmonary edema. So you get pulmonary edema, right? Pulmonary edema. And what are they, what is number one signs of pulmonary edema is what? Pink furosperium. And that is, this is pulmonary edema. And therefore this patient is a B-sharp patient. So it's breathing issue. The lung is full of what? Fluid, it has a pulmonary edema and you have to intervene. So mannitol on with uh, with the pink furosperium is a B-sharp moment. Patient have pulmonary edema and you have to intervene. So those are the five patients you have to intervene. These are medications you got to know, the side effect, how they work, and the are things that shows up on your exams. So number four, different flavor. So we have by the same idea, right? You know how to answer these questions. Which of the following assessment we're looking for an assessment findings will make the nurse to question the medication. Patient is going to receive some medication that I'm going to question, right? I'm going to question that medication, uh, whether we should give it to them. What is the case? A client was prescribed benzotropin for gentin for worsening Parkinson's disease. Which of the following assessment will make the next question. So you know your, your, your acts, you have to find an assessment. You know your case patient is on benzotropin or gentin. Buzzwords, what is that? Benzotropin, congentin, and I need to intervene. Those are the two things I'm worried about. I don't care about anything else. Uh, I may put practicing in it, but congentin, congentin, practicing, and I need to intervene. That's my and uh, rewrite right there. Then what is your content? You have to recognize the medication. So there's two things you can recognize medication, uh, especially if they are anticholinergic. They have tropin and then they have benzotro. You see the opium, the one we saw, uh, this one is tropium, okay? Tro the, the other one is tropin. So this is the tropin. You see, we see tropin here. And the, uh, um, the this previa is a different form. You can see how they can trick you. Let's go back. Um, you see, you see tropium. You see the tropium here? Yeah, it's the same thing. They change it to tropin. It's the same thing. That's the way I recognize anticholinergic. When I see tropium and tropin or atropine, you know, I know it's an anticholinergic. So atropine, you see as the last name, like atropine, yeah, the same thing, tropine or tropium, they're anticholinergic. This, so this is telling you this is an anticholinergic medication. And we use it for Parkinson disease, not to treat the Parkinson itself. That is the key, benztropine, a cogentin is not treating the Parkinson. It, it doesn't allow the Parkinson go. It's used to treat the symptoms of the Parkinson. And that is the, the symptoms of the uh, Parkinson is excessive cholinergic activity. So they have too much acetylcholine. That is what is causing them to behave like that. So the resting tremor and shoveling gait and all those things. And we want to slow it down by blocking the acetylcholine. So that is what the cogentin is doing, is an anti-acetylcholine, cholinergic. So I'm blocking every cholinergic activity um, in the system. And therefore, this is where you have to be in sharp about it and find what are the symptoms of anti-cholinergic. 
that so that's the idea that's what the question is going to emphasize on so symptoms of anticholinergic and then whether it's doing what it's supposed to do so first thing presence of coli. what do you think this is consistent with tardive dyskinesia so that means the patient is having extra pyramidal side effect so they have estro, let me give you some content. They have estro pyramidal side effect. And that is what um, is happening to the, um, the, the Parkinson patient. And estro pyramidal side effect side is AD adapt. Okay. So you have akitesia here, dystonia. Okay. No, acute dystonia, akitesia. Parkinsonism and tardive dyskinesia. So a key example of tardive dyskinesia is torticolysis, basically torticoli. And what it means is like the, the contraction of uh, some most of the time the neck of it. And it's consistent with that disease. So what the reason why they're having this is because of what is going on with them. And the treatment for this is to give them benzotropine. So this is a trap, okay? So benzotropine is going to con control all the symptoms, extra pyramidal symptoms that you we, you see, benzotropine will treat it. So if you see a question about extra pyramidal side effect, the treatment of choice is I will check benzotropine. Therefore, this is nothing. This is going to treat the. So if I see this and he. We are about to give them benzotropine. I'm going to treat this, so I'm okay with that. This one too, epistotonus. What it means is like is a contraction of the muscles of your neck, basically spasm of it. They spasm to the point that on your back, they will ask you, you ask your back, and like you go into spasm, tightening basically. And this is all the same thing. It's the muscle contracting over a certain contraction due to the ascetic calling. And they're behaving like the same thing as torticoli. And what is the benzotropine going to do? Is going to lower the effect of the epistotonus. It's anticholinergic. What is going to happen is going to slow down your bladder. It's going to let you, you're not going to sweat. Your saliva is going to, secretion will go down. And then it's going to worsen your glycoma. So those are the things you're looking for as your answer. So... Urinary retention, yeah, is bad. It's going to make this worse, so I have to question it. History of glycoma, yes. Acute glyco angle gly glycoma is going to worsen this. Resting tremor, that is consistent with Parkinson. This is question is said to trap you. It's consistent with Parkinson. Parkinson disease have resting tremor, and they're having too much resting tremor. So we're going to give them benzotropine to slow it down. So this is fine. Shoveling it is the same thing. It's going to help with the excessive contraction. Therefore, this is this is consistent with what practicing, but the question is going to ask you for what? Benzotropine. It's the same thing. This is the, always the trap. They put something there and you focus on it. The question is asking you which assessment finding require the next question. It's with regard to the medication. Whatever the medication is going to do to the patient is why you're going to question about it. So I'm not going to question if they have shuffling gates because it's consistent with uh, them being practicing resting tremor, uh, um, and uh, presence of particular and epistotonus. Those are all what? consistent with what you're following, except three and four. So number five, same idea, right? Now we're back, who do you see? Who need immediate intervention, clarification of medication? The same idea, okay? A client on chromophene complaining of headache. You have to recognize them. So, chromophene is used for ovulation. So, if a woman is used for infertility, if you can ovulate, you can have a baby. They go to the infertility clinic and they give this this medication. Uh, sometimes they put clomid. It's the same thing. 
but for your exams, they will put chlorophyll. This medication will stimulate ovulation, ovulation, so you have to be know how to use it. So it stimulates you. So when as soon as you start having menses, the third day you start taking it, you take it for five days. So the medication you take it for five days, three days in your menses, right? And then after you finished the medication, that's when the yeah, the, the, uh, you should engage in intercourse because then after five days, you should start right after the five days, then you should start the intercourse for five straight days because that's when the ovulation will be okay. That's timing. The common side effect is like having too much estrogen, okay? Hot flashes, um, headaches. Um, and so the headaches is a normal symptoms of patient who is taking chromaffin, so I'm not going to worry about it. They also get hot flashes, it's fine. A client on MPH and prescription of two unit IV Q12 hours. So they're giving IV Q12 hours MPH. Do you see anything wrong? Well, you have to bring your content. MPH is given twice a day. It's intermediate, so check. That's good. You give it twice a day. But this is the only insulin type that is given by sub-Q, nothing IV. So this is given by sub-Q. So I have to question this. We don't give MPH IV. We give it sub-Q. So I got to question this. A client with Kawasaki disease and prescription for aspirin. What is Kawasaki disease? Is uh, vasculitis of the big vessels. Priority action for vasculitis is what? Coronary artery. So they get artery aneurysm. They get aneurysm and these kids will die. So they have fever for five days. So I call it um, P, okay, um, scream. Basically, those are the symptoms. Uh, where they have conjunctivitis, okay, or tea cream, temperature for five days, conjunctivitis, and uh, they have skin problem, uh, aneurysm. So there's a bunch of symptoms that they are not care. But the most important is aneurysm, coronary aneurysm. In order to prevent this aneurysm, you got to give them aspirin and immunoglobulin. We know we don't like giving patient aspirin young patient aspirin because of Rye syndrome. But this is the only one giving them the aspirin is okay. That will save them from uh, developing aneurysm because it's worse than having Rye syndrome. So this one, that is fine. A client with hypercholesterolemia on atorvastatin and CK, CKP, creatinine kinase, so creatinine kinase of what? 10,000. Do you see anything there? Atovastatin, and I give you CK of 1,000. If you're taking cholesterol medication, as you can remember, this is statin, right? Statin, their side effect is they affect the liver, so they make your LFT goes up and then attack your muscle. So they cause myopathy. Those are the two side effects you should know. LFT increasing because it affects the liver and then they cause muscle pain, myopathy. If you don't do anything about it, this will develop into rhabdo. When it causes muscle pain, the muscle die and muscle releases this protein called creatinine kinase, CK. Creatinine kinase, 10,000, anything above 5,000 is high. So 10,000 is twice the normal. And therefore, this patient is developing rhabdomyolysis, and you have to intervene. So anybody on starting with muscle pain, you have to worry. Be sharp. Um, the creatinine kinase is elevated, you have to worry. Be sharp. They're going to um, shock and then they die from renal failure.
a client on clozapine with muscle rigidity connect pains. You have to recognize this. Clozapine is what? Antipsychotic. Okay. Antipsychotic. And now they have muscle rigidity. What is the number one symptoms you know of that every antipsychotic is taking you should worry about? Is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And where they overreact and the muscle basically overreact and they, 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 they release too much activity. They have high temperature, muscle over contract, rigidity, and autonomic dysfunction. These are one of the uh, hot guys, I always call them. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, malignant epithemia, tyrosome, and serotonin syndrome. The symptoms are the same. So this patient will have like temperature to like 104, 105. Muscle rigidity. Rigidity is always not good in your exams. When you see it, pick it up. So muscle rigidity, clozapine. This has neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is bad. Bad, bad, bad. We got to intervene. You got to cool this patient down. Their temperature will be like 104. Otherwise, they will fry it up. So we got to intervene. Those are the signs. I mean, it's symptoms they can give you on clozapine or they can give you a granulocytosis. But this one, we're dealing with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. A client on azithromycin prescribed is a prasidone for hallucination. The same thing. Ciprasidone is antipsychotic, and you use it for um, treat um, hallucinated people. Okay, azithromycin is antibiotic. Okay, remember all the mycin they are part of the macrolide. We call them macrolides. So every myosin, chlorotomycin, they are all part of that group. So when you see them, erythromycin, chlorotomycin, and um, azithromycin, they are macrolate. They all lead to QT prolongation. That's their number one set side effect. This antibiotic, it causes QT prolongation. Zaprasidone does the same thing. It's a second generation antipsychotic. It's also lead to QT prolongation. You don't want to put two, two QT prolongation medication together. Otherwise, you have to sad. Therefore, we need to intervene. So this patient, 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 Kawasaki, this is good. MPH, we have to intervene. And this one, we don't. So two, four, five, six. And finally, we have a six-year-old, so we got to read from the back. Which of the following medication the nurse anticipates? So that means we anticipate some medication. A six-year-old client was brought into the PEDS clinic because of frequent brief stare to the sky. Just looking to the sky and daydreaming. This will occur 10 times a day. Which of the following medication the next anticipate. But this one, this is I put it in the next generation kind of question. You have to make the diagnosis and treat. So you expect it to this to be a passing level question. Make a diagnosis and treat. So what do you think? Brief stare in the sky, daydream, 10 times a day is what? Absent seizure. So that's absent seizure. Basically, your board like this because it will be a kid that the mother will think they something is wrong with them and they that they have to know because it's dangerous. They will be going in the middle of the street and they will stop. They will stay. Decision is like a few seconds, 30 seconds. They is done and they come back to the original state. They don't have any post ecto state. They they normal. They don't like loose bowel function, bladder function. The post-otis ectostate is almost normal as if nothing happened. It's just that brief moment they lost. So there's a treatment for that, and you have to know it, okay? 
So I set it and I put everything like an examiner will do. All of them have E's in it. And so you can't guess. So, but you can figure out, you can find, if you don't know the answer, look at each one and see and if you recognize them, what it does and it'll eliminate. If you don't know, eliminate the, the wrong answers and you will left with one. So, you know, ephedrine, this guy, ephedrine is a stimulant. We're not going to stimulate a kid. He is having seizure, right? So I'll take this out. And Tobitol, do you recognize it? This is TB medication. Side effect is optic neuritis. This is a TB medication. So I eliminate you. Let's leave this alone. Hydrophonia. What, do you recognize it? Well, this is used for people with myasthenia gravis to diagnose whether they are in crisis. Basically, you inject, it's a cholinergic. You inject it in them, and then they will, their symptoms get better. Then you know, is it myasthenia gravis? They lack in acetylcholine. Therefore, this is that. And this is the name, a toxic mind, mind, that you have to know um, this medication for absent seizure, okay? and toxicimide. Know this and you'll be fine for absent seizure at toxicimide. And this is the end of it. Wonderful questions, thought-provoking. I know you gain something out of it. These are medication, you got to know them by heart and you'll be fine. Thank you for staying around to the hand and um, Please visit the channel for more content like this and share with your friends. And, and as always, keep charging. And if you have not subscribed, um, please subscribe and leave comments. This is what is going to keep the channel growing, subscription and comment and likes. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye.